Right, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Tom Mukorosi. Welcome to lecture five of Cricket South Africa's level two presentation presented by Western Province Cricket Umpires Association. This evening, I will be going through revision questions from Monday. I will then take you through today's laws, the first three of them, laws 30, 31 and 34. Then Abdullah will take us through laws 36, 37 and 40. And he will then go through tonight's revision questions. And then of course we'll open the floor up to questions and answers. So going on to Monday's revision questions. At the start of the innings, the fielding captain seeks permission from the opposing captain for a substitute to act as their wicketkeeper. Is this allowed? What happens next? Law says that the opposing captain cannot decline this request as it is not for the opposing captain to grant a substitute, but for the umpires alone to make that decision. The umpires may allow the substitute to keep wicket if he or she got injured during the warm up before the start of play. Next question. Explain the procedure to follow if a fielder fails to take the field at the start of the match or at any later time or leaves the field during play. A few things for umpires to do. Umpires need to be informed of the reason for this absence and shall take the time when the player leaves or does not take the field. The player shall not thereafter come onto the field of play during a session of play without the consent of either umpire. The umpire shall give such content, consent as soon as practical and he or she shall not be permitted to bowl until having been back on the field of play for a period of time known as penalty time. Next, we went on to a couple of penalty time questions. In a 50 over match that started at 10 a.m., Wendy pulls a groin and leaves the field at 10.09. She returns with permission of the umpire at 10.31. When can Wendy bowl again? This one is pretty straightforward. She was off the field for 22 minutes. So when she comes back onto the field, she needs to serve 22 minutes of penalty time, which means that she will be allowed to bowl at 10.53, 22 minutes from 10.31. Another straightforward one in a 50 over match, Peter pulls a hamstring and leaves the field at 10.30. He returns with the permission of the umpire at 10.45. At 11.05, Peter's captain asks when Peter can bowl again. Let's have a look. Please remember to put your microphone on mute. Thank you. Peter left the field at 10.30 and returned at 10.45, so he was off the field for 15 minutes. At 10.45, he needed to serve 15 minutes of penalty time. That 15 minutes will have been served at 11 a.m. So in fact, he would have been allowed to bowl at 11 a.m. even before the captain asked what time he should bowl again. So remember that we said for application on the field, good umpiring practice is as soon as a player returns to the field, you need to calculate when he or she can bowl again and you inform that bowler as well as the captain what time that bowler can bowl again. So in this scenario, when Peter came back onto the field at 10.45, we should have immediately informed 
Peter and his captain that he can bowl again at 1100 hours. Now we get on to a longer period of absence in a 50 over match. This question wasn't worded that well, um, so I'm going to read it with a little bit of better wording. Uh, in a 50 over match that started at 10 a.m., the opening batter of Team B, John, pulls a hamstring while fielding and leaves the field at 1100. John returns with the permission of the umpire at 12.45. Okay, so first thing to do is just to note how long he's been off the field, but then remember that there's also a maximum penalty time that can be served. The batting innings of Team A ends at 1300 hours, so that was John back on the field from 1245 to 1300 hours. Lunch is taken from 1300 to 1340. Team B's innings starts at 1340. When can John bat for Team B? He's normally the opening batter. Can he open the innings? I don't think so. Let's have a look at the answer. So John left the field and at 11 a.m. and returned at 1245. He was off the field for 105 minutes, but law restricts penalty time to a maximum of 90 minutes. So when he returned to the field at 1245, he needed to serve 90 minutes of penalty time. He served 15 minutes of penalty time from 1245 to 1300. Lunch is a scheduled break, therefore the 40 minutes of lunch does not count for or against John because it was not playing time. He then still needs to serve 90 minus 15 minutes that he has served. He still needs to serve 75 minutes of penalty time from 1340 when they start to bat and that will take us to 1455 or when his side is five wickets down whichever comes first okay um, put that extra little bit of information in your answer uh, to show your understanding of the law so that's it for monday's revision questions now we move on to this evening's laws and we start with law 30 the batter out of his or her ground let's watch a video and abdullah if there is no sound on the video please alert me if there is sound then uh, we carry on uh, copy that tom batsman out of his or her ground when a batsman is out of his or her ground, he or she risks being stumped or run out. So when it the batsman out of his or her ground. <laughs> um, can I ask that the person with their camera and the sound on, please mute your microphone and switch off your camera. Thank you. I'll start the video again. Batsman out of his or her ground. When a batsman is out of his or her ground, he or she risks being stumped or run out. So when is a batsman out of his or her ground? According to Law 30, a batsman shall be considered to be out of his or her ground unless the bat he or she is holding or some part of the batsman's person is grounded behind the popping crease at that end. Here, for example, the bat is on the crease marking but not behind it, which means the batsman is 
most definitely out. But would the batsman be out now? Both the bat and the batsman are over the line, but neither the bat nor any part of the batsman's person is grounded, i.e. in contact with the ground. So, yes, that's out again. This being cricket, there is an exception to this part of the law. If a batsman, who must be running or diving, has already made his or her ground, either with the bat or any part of the body, but subsequently loses contact with the ground while continuing his or her forward momentum as the wicket is put down, he or she will be not out. Next question, and this can be a bit of a headache, what constitutes each batsman's ground? Well, when one batsman is in a ground, i.e. grounded behind a popping crease, then the ground at the other end belongs to the other batsman. If neither is in his or her ground, for example when they are both running between wickets or even stationary, each ground belongs to the batsman who is nearest to it. If both batsmen are level, then where they were before drawing level is the deciding factor. Of course, this being cricket, there are further delightful complications, such as two batsmen in the same ground, or three when you have a striker with a runner. But never fear, all mental anguish will clear with a little quiet meditation and reference to Law 30 in the Blue Book. Pop question for all of you, and you can type your answer in the chat box. Is this better in his ground or not? You can see that he is leaning on his bat with the thigh of his right leg, uh, but is not holding the bat. The bat is grounded beyond the popping crease when the Wicketkeeper breaks the stumps. Uh, question to you all is whether the bat not held is considered as part of the batsman uh, or is he out of his ground? I'm going to give you the answer in a couple of seconds time but i'd like for all of you to either type out or not out and then i shall give you the answer soon yes those of you who said out are correct the bat needs to be held in the hand of the batter to be considered part of the batter okay so very important the bat needs to be held in the hand or a glove that is in the hand of a batter to be considered as part of the person of the batter. Okay. Law 31 is appeals. Can an umpire give a batter out without an appeal? Let's see what the law says. Neither umpire shall give a batter out, even though he or she may be out under the laws, ex unless appealed to by a fielder. This shall not debar a batter who is out under any of the laws from leaving the wicket without an appeal having been made. Note, however, that an umpire shall intervene if satisfied that a batter, not having been given out, has left the wicket under a misapprehension of being out. The umpire intervening shall call and signal dead ball to prevent any further action by the fielding side and shall recall the batter. A batter may be recalled at any time up to the instant when the ball comes into play for the next delivery unless it is the final wicket of the innings, in which case it should be up to the instant when the umpires leave the field. 
we've got a very interesting video to show you about a withdrawal of an appeal by a international captain. And so we shall look at that in a bit more detail. Timing of an appeal. For an appeal to be valid, it must be made before the bowler begins his or her run up. Or if there is no run up, then the bowling action to deliver the next ball. Of course, the bowling action starts when the back foot of the bowler lands. And of course, um, before time has been called. The call of over, very important, does not invalidate an appeal made prior to the start of the following over, provided that time has not been called. How do we appeal? You get a lot of different players screaming and shouting at an umpire, various forms of how was that? But I think it's pretty common knowledge that if a fielder or bowler turns to you and screams in the air, uh, then he's or she's probably appealing. OK, so let's not get too technical on that as long as there's clearly a query from the fielding side as to whether a batter is out or not, we shall accept that as an appeal. How do we answer appeals? And who answers which appeals? The strikers and umpire shall answer all appeals arising out of laws hit wicket, stumped or run out, when this occurs at the striker's end, which is when the wicketkeeper is generally involved, and the bowler's end umpire shall answer all other appeals. When an appeal is made, each umpire shall answer only on any matter that falls within his or her jurisdiction. When a batter has been given not out, either umpire may answer an appeal if it is on a further matter and is within his or her jurisdiction. Remember that an appeal covers all modes of dismissal. So when a player, when a batter plays and misses against a spinner and the wicket keeper whips off the bails, the wicket keeper will typically be appealing for a stumping. However, the bowler's end umpire also needs to be sure that there was no edge. And so if there is an appeal, then the bowler's end umpire can, if he or she is sure that there was an edge that the wicket keeper actually caught, then the bowlers and umpire can give that better out caught behind. OK, um, but typically it's a good idea if you are unsure um, is to look at which umpire the players are appealing to and then that umpire should make his or her decision first. Consultation by the umpires, very important. You cannot consult for everything. If you have got a leg before wicket decision to make, you make it on your own. You can glance at your partner um, by not turning your head, but only um, moving your eyes to see if there's a signal coming from your partner at striker's end to indicate that he or she feels the ball might be too high and going over the stumps. Um, but you need to agree those nonverbal signals before the match and have trust in your partner to be able to use such um, communication. If, however, you have a court behind uh, where we're not sure if the ball has carried to the wicketkeeper, 
the strikers and umpires usually in a better position to see whether the ball bounced or not or went straight into the hands of the wicketkeeper on the full. So there, even though the appeal is to be answered by the bowlers and umpire, the bowlers and umpires' view might have been blocked by the bowler following through. So then call and signal dead ball so that you can go and consult with your partner at striker's end, come together, and typically the law says that you should go back to your position behind the bowler's end stumps. Um, but I think that creates too much of a scene, so it's quite acceptable from your uh, midpoint position where you met with your strikers and colleague to decide whether or not the ball had carried. Uh, you can simply give the striker out if it has carried or not out if it didn't carry from that position where the two of you met to consult. If you are both in doubt, then the answer is always not out. Okay. Withdrawal of an appeal. The captain of the fielding side may withdraw an appeal only after obtaining the consent of the umpire within whose jurisdiction the appeal falls. If such consent is given, the umpire concerned shall, if applicable, revoke the decision and recall the batter. The withdrawal of an appeal must be before the instant when the ball comes into play for the next delivery or, if the innings has been completed, the instant when the umpires leave the field. So let's have a look at a great example of a withdrawal of an appeal. Apologies for the quality of this video, but uh, the narration is very good for you to understand if you can't see everything, what exactly transpired. Putting on 162 for the third wicket. Then in the final ball of the session, incredible controversy. Owen oh, Morgan thought he'd scored four here after some clumsy fielding by Pravan Kumar. And the batsman began walking off the tee. Replay showed, though, the ball never actually touched the rope. So when the bales came off, with Morgan and Bell on their way back to the pavilion, India appealed, perhaps unsportingly, for the unlikeliest run-out you will ever see. And the letter of the law said Bell had to go. A dramatic and savoury end, it seemed, to a brilliant innings of 137. Bell bemused, the crowd furious, with England 254 for four, where the second session had ended in booze and acrimony, and the England batsman walked back onto the field after tea. It was to astonish stares and then huge cheers to see Ian Bell amongst them. During the interval, Indian captain MS Dhoni had sportingly withdrawn their successful appeal over Bell's controversial run-out. A big call in every sense, the spirit of the game prevailing over the letter of the law. But England were determined to make their own headlines with their batting. Owen Morgan bringing up his half century in stunning. Putting up the letter of the law prevailing, sorry, the spirit of the law prevailing over the letter of the law there. And uh, what's interesting there is obviously that the batter was recalled after time would have been called for T. And also, um, the batter had already left the field. Um, so they went a little bit against the law there um, in terms of the timing of the withdrawal of the appeal. Uh, but obviously, everybody was quite happy and um, it all ended up in good spirits. Uh, just in terms of practical practice, um, especially when it comes to the obstruction of the field uh, that's quite often a um a contentious um mode of dismissal 
as well as uh, what's commonly referred to as the mancad running out of the um, non-striker by the bowler uh, because the non-striker was backing up too far. Um, it's a good idea for when you get appeals for either of those two modes of dismissals, come together with your partner and just discuss what you saw because the two angles that you saw the same incident from uh, could differ in terms of what you saw versus what your partner saw. Um, make sure that you apply the letter of the law, but then also give the opposing captain or the fielding captain the opportunity to withdraw the appeal. So at international level, the captains has have said no. If we have appealed, then we are not going to withdraw the appeal. So don't ask us if we want to withdraw the appeal. However, at uh, club cricket, uh, we encourage the spirit of cricket to be prevalent. Um, so when we do have the contentious appeal of obstructing the field or running out the non-striker, uh, then the umpires shall after let's say on their way to uh, conferring about the decision, um, the bowlers and umpire should ask the captain if the captain is happy to continue with the appeal or would he consider withdrawing the appeal. And what you'll probably find is you might not get an immediate answer from the captain. Uh, the captain might want to chat to his team uh, there you will be chatting to your partner at the same time in terms of what you saw. Was it obstruction? Was it not? Uh, if it's uh, out for running out the non-striker at the bowler's end, uh, then had the arm reached the point of release um, before the run out was attempted, um, so those are the type of questions you need to answer with your colleague before you decide whether to give the uh, batter out or not out. And hopefully in that time while you're conferring, then the opposing or the fielding captain will come to you and withdraw the appeal. But of course, if they do not withdraw the appeal, then you need to apply the letter of the law and give your decision of out or not out without fear or favor. Next law, law 34, hit the ball twice. Let's see what the law has to say. Can we hit the ball twice? If so, when and are any runs scored when a batter hits the ball lawfully twice? Hit the ball twice. Hit the ball twice and you're out. Unless, of course, you're defending your wicket or it was accidental, in which case you're still in. The striker is out hit the ball twice if, while the ball is in play, it strikes any part of his person or is struck by his bat and, before the ball has been touched by a fielder, he willfully strikes it again with his bat or person. The key word here is willfully. But if this had happened instead, the batsman would remain in. In other words, inadvertent double strikes don't count. The batsman is allowed to hit the ball a second time in order to guard his wicket. He can use his bat or almost any part of his body. He cannot, however, use a hand that's not holding the bat. The only time you can't use your bat to hit the ball twice to defend your wicket is when it would prevent a catch. The batsman can also hit the ball a second time in order to return it to a fielder, as long as a fielder has given him permission to do so. If you'd like to swat up on this a bit more, 
simply turn to Law 34 in the Blue Book, where you'll find all the nitty-gritty detail you need. For exam purposes, it's important to note that the bowler does not get credit for a batter being dismissed, hit the ball twice. That is my lot for the evening. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm going to hand over to Abdullah to take us through laws 36, 37 and 40. Over to you, Abdullah. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Thomas. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, law 36, LBW. The most contentious law every uh, weekend, or every match day. Of all the appeals on every given match day, LBW is, or the most of the appeals are for LBW. So it's, a, it's very important that you get a good understanding and grasp of uh, this particular law. You start with the video. Uh, Abdullah, I'm not hearing any sound on my side. Okay, let me just give me a second. Let me just go out again and see my screen again. Leg before wicket. I'm hearing it now. Thanks, Dula. Copy that. Thanks, Tom. LBW is a little like the offside rule in football. Many people claim to know it, but how many people really do? Our handy checklist means that whether you find yourself umpiring an international test match or the kids on the beach, your reputation for fairness will remain intact. There are five basic criteria to consider. The batsman is out, leg before wicket, if one, the bowler bowls a ball that isn't a no ball, unlike this poor fellow. Two, the ball, if it is not intercepted on the full, pitches in line between wicket and wicket or on the offside of the batsman's wicket. It cannot be out if the ball pitches outside the line of the leg stump. Three, the ball hits the batsman either full pitch or after pitching and before he hits it with his bat. Four, ah, this is where it gets a bit more complicated. If the batsman was making a genuine attempt to play the ball, the point of impact must be between wicket and wicket for LBW to be an option. However, if the batsman has made no genuine attempt to play the ball, the contact must either be between wicket and wicket or outside the line of the off stump. Five, this is the crucial part. But for the interception by the batsman, the ball would have gone on to hit the stumps and dislodge the bales. Any questions? Just refer to Law 36 in the Blue Book. So what are the points to consider for LBW? Firstly, should ball should not be a no ball. Secondly, the ball needs to pitch in line between wicket and wicket or on the offside of the wicket. If the ball pitches, pitches outside leg stump, will always be not out. Ball pitching outside leg stump, always not out. The ball should not have touched the bat first of the batter. If there's any contact with the bat first, uh, the, it will always be not out. If the contact is with pad first and then the bat, then you can consider the LBW appeal. But if it's bat first and then pad, you will not consider the LB appeal. You will say not out if it is bat first. The striker intercepts the ball with 
any part of his or her person. Yes, the, um, the wording is LBW, leg before wicket, uh, but according to this law, any part of the person, so whether his arm, shoulder, uh, his head is in front of the wicket, you can consider the LBW appeal. The point of impact needs to be between wicket and wicket unless the batter has made no genuine attempt to play the ball with the bat, then the contact can either be between, be between wicket and wicket or on the offside of the wicket. So again, this point for LBW to be considered, if a shot is played, the impact must be between wicket and wicket. If no shot has been played, then the impact can be between wicket and wicket, or the impact can also be on the offside of the wicket. And lastly, in your opinion, the ball must have gone on to hit the wicket. So these five bullet points you need to consider when there is an LBW appeal, uh, yes, it might sound a lot, but uh, the brain is a wonderful thing. And also with experience, you will, your brain will work through all these, the, these five points when there is an uh, LBW uh, appeal. Uh, importantly, don't go on the appeal or how loud they appeal or how strongly they appeal or who's appealing or who the better is is that's uh, facing, you should only consider uh, these five points. So when it comes to LBW, which is the offside of the wicket? Let's see what the law tells us. So the offside of the striker's wicket shall be determined by the batter stance from the moment the ball comes into play for that particular delivery. So if you can close your eyes and visualize this, and let's say it's a right hand uh, batter, the moment the, bat, the bowler takes his first step, that is when the ball comes into play, and that is where you just from that moment the striker's uh, offside will be, uh, that is a way you judge the striker's offside. I'll, if I can illustrate this point again by the use of a picture. So this is a right-handed uh, batter. So the moment the ball comes into play, so the moment the batter takes his first step, the offside of the wicket shall be on the left hand side. The leg side is where the ball is, that is considered the leg side of the batter. And that will, for LBW, that will stay his leg side and the other side will stay his off side. Even if the batter changes uh, grip, changes stance, switch it, when it comes to LBW and you're judging which side is the offside or the, the leg side of the batter, all you need to judge is the moment the bullet, when it takes his first step, that is when you make the call which is the offside and the leg side of the batter. So in this picture, let's say the bullet takes his first step. This is a right-handed batter. So on the right-hand side where the ball is, that would be the leg side, and the other side would be the off side. Even if this batter should, should switch it, um, change right around, and now being a left-handed batter, the right-hand side will stay, the, will stay the leg side. Let's go through a few RBW appeals, and we'll go through the various uh, points. So if you look at uh, this particular uh, this picture, where did this uh, ball pitch? So let's assume all, um, when we look at the pictures, the ball is not a no ball. So firstly, 
did this ball pitch on the offside or uh, of the of the right-handed batter or between wicket and wicket? No, it did not. It pitched outside leg stump. So because the ball pitched outside leg stump, what does the law tell us? You can never be out LBW if the ball pitches outside leg stump. Go through this picture. First thing we need to consider where the ball pitches. Did it pitch outside off stump or did it pitch between wicket and wicket? Yes, it pitched between wicket and wicket. Where was the impact? Was the impact between wicket and wicket? Did the batter play a shot? In this picture, yes. The impact is between wicket and wicket and the batter play a shot. What is the last point that you need to consider? Would the ball have gone on to hit the stumps? So in this picture, yes, this batter is a candidate. So you've taken into account all the points that you need to consider. And the last point and the, a very important point is, in your opinion, would this ball have gone on to hit the wicket? If your answer to that last question is yes, give this batter out LBW. In your opinion, it would not have gone on to hit the wicket, give him not out. First thing to consider, did it pitch outside off stump or between wicket and wicket? Yes, it pitched outside off stump. Where was the impact? Was the impact between wicket and wicket and did he play a shot? Yes, he did play a shot, but the impact was not between wicket and wicket. The impact was outside the line or outside off stump. So in this case, because he played a shot and the impact is outside off stump, this cannot be out LBW. Let's consider this appeal. Where did it pitch? Did it pitch outside off or between wicket and wicket? Yes, it pitched outside off. Where was the impact? Was the impact between wicket and wicket? No, the impact was outside off stump. Did he play a shot? No, he's not playing a shot. So can you consider this uh, LBW appeal? Yes, you can consider the appeal. Yes, he didn't play a... Uh, yes, the impact was outside off stump, but because he's not offering a shot, you can consider this LB appeal, even though it's, uh, it's outside the line. So what is the last thing that you need to ask yourself? Would this ball have gone on to hit the stumps? If your answer to that question is yes, you then give this better out LBW. If the answer to that question is no, your answer will then be uh, not out. So, so yes, this better is a candidate, but if I look at this picture and if I look at the line of the ball, I don't think this ball came back enough to hit the stumps. So my opinion, I would give this better not out because I don't think this ball came back enough to go on to hit the stumps. What's the first question you ask yourself? Did the ball pitch outside off stump or did it pitch uh, between wicket and wicket? Yes, it pitched between wicket and wicket. Was the impact between wicket and wicket? And did he play a shot? So yes, he played a shot and the impact was between wicket and wicket. What is the last point that you need to consider? Would this ball have gone on to hit the stumps? So looking at where the ball pits, where it hit, and if you can just visualize this, so I, so I would say this is a left arm over the wicket bowler bowling. So left arm over the wicket to a right-handed batter, pitch the ball, in line, so it, yes, it pitched in line. The impact was also in line, but if you look at the angle of the ball, if you look at the stride that the batter uh, got in, uh, if you if you just look at the the popping crease, the popping crease is 1.22 meters from the stumps. He got in a bit of a half a stride, so let's say that's another 30, 40, 50 centimeters. 
So this ball still needs to travel a further 1.8 meters. Looking at the angle, I don't think this ball would have gone on to hit the stumps. I think this would, will be missing off stump. So when it comes to a left arm over the wicket uh, bowler to a right-handed uh, batter, one of the things that I look for uh, is I, and then when I would consider LB appeal is it needs to pitch in line and I'm looking for the bowler to bring the ball back into the right-handed batter. So I want the ball to pitch in line and I want the ball to come back at the right-handed batter. That is one of the keys I look for. So if, if it pitches in line and he plays forward and the angle is going across, it's a good possibility that ball is uh, missing off. That's just one of the key things. This, by the way, I've, I'm just mentioning this, the things that I look for when a left-arm bowler over the wicket is bowling to a right-handed batter. I am look for pitching in line, bringing it back. If I see uh, he pitches in line, brings it back, then I'll, I'll strongly consider the LB appeal. What's the first question we ask yourself? Did it pitch outside off or between wicket and wicket? Yes, in this case, it pitched outside off. Where was the impact? The impact was between wicket and wicket and the batter is playing a shot. What is the last question that you need to ask yourself? Would this ball have gone on to hit the stumps? So looking at where the ball pitches, looking at the angle that it came back to the batter, uh, looking at the, the, the stride, the little stride that he got forward. Um, as I mentioned previously, the popping crease is 1.22 meters from the, from the bowling crease. But a stride forward, this ball still needs to travel about 1 in 1.6, 1.7 meters on the angle. I think this ball is missing leg. So it, so all the points of LBW I considered pitching outside of impact in line. But that last point, very important point that you need to ask yourself, would it gone on to hit the wicket? And my answer for this appeal, I don't think this ball would have gone on to hit the wicket, missing leg stump. Again, did it pitch outside off stump or between wicket and wicket? It pitched outside off stump. Was the impact in line? Yes, the impact was between wicket and wicket and he's playing a shot. What is the last question that you need to ask yourself? In your opinion, would this ball have gone on to hit the stumps? So in my opinion, if you look at again, bit of a stride forward, hitting the batter uh, right at the top of, of the pad, I think this ball is still climbing and going over the stumps. So hence, I will decline the LBW appeal. Obstructing the field. Let's look at a video first. Obstructing the field. A batsman is out obstructing the field if he or she willfully attempts to obstruct or distract the fielding side by word or action. Like this, for example. Thank you, Tommy. In particular, it is considered to be obstruction if, while the ball is in play and after the striker has played the ball, either batsman willfully strikes the ball with a hand not holding the bat or any other part of his or her person or with the bat. The exception to this is when the batsman is attempting to defend his or her wicket. The batsman may do this with the bat or any part of his or her person, except with a hand not holding the bat. If the batsman uses such a hand, he or she will be out obstructing the field. The handled the ball law no longer exists, with such incidents now covered by obstructing the field instead. 
the obstruction has to be willful. Accidental obstruction or obstruction caused by trying to avoid injury does not count and the decision on that is down to the umpire. It's worth noting that if a catch is obstructed, it is the striker who is out, even if it was the non-striker who caused the obstruction. Mind you, it's not always an easy decision. Here, the batsman deliberately crosses out of the legal running area in order to attempt to obstruct a throw. There is no other reason why the batsman should be running across the pitch. What looked an accident was, in fact, an illegal incident. To avoid any possible confusion, read Law 37 in black and white in the blue book. Thanks, Tommy. Before we get to run scored, just to emphasize again, when it comes to obstructing the field, things that you need to look out for is, was the obstruction willful? That's the first thing. If yes, then you can consider the, um, the appeal. If the obstruction was accidental, then not out. Or if the obstruction was to avoid injury, then also not out. And also always, Tom alluded to it earlier, always try to buy yourself a bit of time. So when it comes to an obstructing the field appeal, call dead ball, ask the fielding side for the ball, go walk over and have a word with your colleague. Discuss what you saw, what your colleague saw, go through and ask your colleague, was the, according to you, the ob obstruction willful? If yes, then you can you give the batter out. If it was accidental, if a colleague said to you, I think uh, it was accidental, or I think the batter tried to avoid injury in those two instances, then not out. A run scored from obstructing the field. So if the obstruction prevents a catch from being made, then no runs will be scored. So that's point number two. If the obstruction prevents a catch, no run shall be scored. For any other obstruction, Runs can be scored, so runs completed by the batters before the offence shall be scored, together with any runs awarded for penalties. So in terms of runs scored, yes, you can score runs. And no, no is if the obstruction prevent, prevented a catch, then no runs shall be scored. For any other type of obstruction, runs completed by the batters shall be scored together with any runs awarded for penalties. And importantly, when it comes to obstructing, obstructing the field, the bowler does not get credit for this dismissal. Bowler does not get credit. The last law for this evening, before I start with the revision questions, and I will open the floor uh, to, to answer the revision questions, so the timeout law. So after a wicket fell or the retirement of a batter, the new batter must, or unless time has been called, be in position to take guard or the other batter need to be ready to receive the next ball within three minutes of the dismissal or the retirement. If this requirement is not met, then the incoming batter will, on appeal, be given out, timed out. So important things to take away from this. The fall of a wicket or the retirement of a batter, three minutes. That's the important thing. And on appeal, the incoming batter so I'll be given out time out. 
in my almost 15 years of umpiring, I've never um, given a batsman out, uh, timed out. Uh, it's always important that try to find out if the batter is a bit late, why it was late. I can remember I did a club game and the incoming batter took quite a while um, to come out. It was more than three minutes. As he got to the wicket, I asked him, why are you taking so long to get to the wicket? He said to me, they've only got two sets of pads and two sets of gloves. So meaning when the opening bat was dismissed, the opening bat first they had to pad off, take off his pad, um, take off his uh, inner inner thigh, take off his gloves, and then the, the new batter could only pad up and come to the wicket. So always find out why sometimes there is a good reason why the incoming batter is not there within three minutes. But according to the law, the law only gives you three minutes to get to the wicket. Importantly, when it comes to the time out dismissal, the bowler does not get credit for this wicket. Bowler does not get credit for the timed out dismissal. So that's all the laws we are covering for this evening. I am now opening, I'm going to, going to start the, with the revision questions and I will open the floor. Tom, if you can assist me. Um, yeah, I'll start with the first revision question. So it's the last ball of the over and the batter edges the ball to the keeper. There's no appeal, and because there's no appeal, you as the umpire don't have to make a decision. You then call over, and you now start walking towards your position, your, your new position at the striker's end. But as you take your first step, there is an appeal by the middle fielder for the catch. Discuss and explain what will you do next. Tom, do we have any hands? Yes, we do, Abdullah. Uh, Jitendra, please unmute your microphone and help us answer the question. Yeah, good evening all. Yeah, the, the answer for this goes like this. So uh, the, call of, the call of an over does not invalidate the appeal. The appeal is valid till the ball comes into play for the next delivery or the time has been called. So uh, there is a there is full uh, chance that the umpire can give him out uh, caught one. So uh, do, do you expect some more uh, detailed version or is this okay? Tatindra, well done. E excellent answer. Let's see what the memo say and the detail they want in the memo. So as you uh, said, for an appeal to be valid, it needs to be made before the bowler begins his uh, run-up for the next over, or if he doesn't have a run-up, his bowling action, and it needs to be done before time has been called. So the law is clear that the call of over does not invalidate an appeal as long as it's made prior to the start of the next over. So the moment the bowler gives his first step for the next over, that means that over has begun. And that moment he gave his first step, that appeal now becomes, or is, that appeal is not valid anymore. So if it's done before then, you can consider the appeal. And obviously it needs to be done uh, before time has been called. If you've called time, then that appeal is not valid anymore. So yes, in this scenario, the appeal by the middle fielder is still valid. And you as bowlers in umpire, you saw the edge, the batter edge the ball, and the catch was taken cleanly. So you should give the striker out court. Uh, yes, it, it's a good decision, but also a very, very brave uh, decision. And the incoming batter will be on strike for the next uh, ball, if applicable. Thanks, Jitendra. 
Yeah, one second, sir. One second, one second. Can I hold you here? Yes, you can hold me. Yeah, the last line it was written. Can you go back there? Incoming batsman to be on strike for the next delivery. Uh, I think this is this should not be the case because this is the last ball of off and over, and it's a bad delivery. So the incoming batsman will be there as an on strike again, sir. You are correct, Tindra. The the non striker should should be um, facing the first ball of the next. I don't know. I better make it. Yes, sir. yes, sir. Uh, thank you for that, Tindra. Thank you, sir. Next question. I alluded to it earlier that eighty percent of all appeals that an umpire will adjudicate on any given day is for LBW. So what criteria will you take or will you consider when there is an LBW appeal? There are five criteria. Uh, Tom, do you have any hands raised? Uh, can I get one each? Yes, Abdullah, we've got uh, one hand so far, but I'm sure more will come up. Uh, yeah. Shashi Kant, you can start us off. What is the first criteria that we need to take into consideration when adjudicating a leg before we get decision? Shashi Kant, you had your hand up. It's now down. Are you going to unmute your microphone and answer? I see your microphone is unmuted. Now I can hear you. Yeah, the ball should pitch in offside of the wicket when the ball is building right term off, uh, right term over. Okay. Um, I would have liked to start right at the beginning, uh, Shashi Kant. Uh, what is the first criteria of the delivery? It should pitch in line of the wicket. Um, we will get to that one. So what I'll do is I'll ask Merceline uh, if you can unmute your microphone and give us the first criteria for adjudicating a no ball. Uh, sorry, a leg before we can decision. Uh, the ball should be a valid ball, meaning it should not be a no ball. Fantastic. Merceline, that is the first thing we need to look out for. Uh, Victor, uh, you've got your hand up next. Um, please unmute your microphone. Uh, where does the ball need to pitch? Um, Shashi Kant has already alluded to it, but um, it can pitch in two places. Can you tell us which of those two places are? Okay, how's that, bro? Good, Vic, go ahead. So, so um, as Shashika said, um, it should um, it should be not a no ball. Mm -hmm. It should be a fair delivery, and then um, the ball pitch either um outside of stump or in the line of the wicket with um with impact of hitting the stumps. Perfect, Vic. You've given us where it needs to pitch. That's all we needed from you. Uh, next hand up is Pankaj. Pankaj, uh, what else do we have to consider in terms of the impact of the ball? Or the ball should, uh, the leg uh, before we uh, uh, hitting the pads in line uh, with the stumps, in line with the stump to stump. Okay. Um, can the ball hit the pads outside uh, of the off stump? Yes, it can be in that case. But uh, the in that case, the batsman uh, uh, is not in a position to play the ball. I mean, he is not playing the ball. Then it not can, playing a shot. Yeah, not playing the shot. Correct, Pankaj. Thank you very much. Uh, next, I see uh, Nishan, uh, your hand was up. Uh, can you tell us 
in terms of impact, which needs to be first? Is it bat first or pad first? I agree with me. Uh, it should have not touched the bat first. 100%. Thank you. And then next hand up is Varun. Varun, what is the final thing that we need to consider to adjudicate a leg before we can decision, please? Uh, sir, for interception, the ball should have hit the wicket. Except for the interception, the ball should have hit the wicket. Abdullah, I think we've covered it all. If you can take us through the memo, please. Yes, we've covered it all. Uh, very detailed uh, memo, but we've covered not being a noble, pitches in line between wicket and wicket, or on the offside, should not have touched the bat first. The impact either between wicket and wicket, or it can be outside off stump if no shot was played. And lastly, if it was not for the interception, would the ball have gone on to hit the wicket? So well done and to everyone. And last question for the evening. So if you need to visualize this, that would help you answer this question. So if you can close your eyes and or read and just uh, visualize this. So this is a right arm off spinner bowling from over the wicket to a left handed batter. So a right arm off spinner over the wicket to a left handed batter. So this left handed batter now changes his stance to that of a right-handed batter to play the switch, switch it. So if you can visualize, he is a left-handed batter. He now switch it, turn himself around, and he's now a right-handed batter. The ball now pitches outside the off stump of the now uh, right-handed batter. The batter then misses the ball, and it hits the batter on the back pad below the knee roll in front of middle stump. There's a huge appeal. What will your decision be? So Very visualize what's happening and Tom, do we have any hands? Very good scenario, Dula. We've got uh, six hands. The one that was up first is Njuguna. Njuguna, if you can unmute your microphone and give us your decision for this leg before we can appeal, please. Yeah, thank you, Tom. Um, I think in my opinion from my reading, it was as long as the batsman did not change his action before the bowler came in to bowl, meaning that his original stance and the ball pitching outside leg stump, then my decision would be not out. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Um, well, Abdullah, you want to give us the yeah, answer, yes, Tom. please? Yeah, yes, Tom. No, you got a spot on. Uh, well done. Uh, was it in Zakuna? Yes. Yeah, uh, great answer in Zakuna. Yes, your answer to the appeal will be not out. And why is it not out? Because when the ball pitches outside leg stump, a batter can never be given out LBW. Why did this ball pitch outside leg stump? How do you determine this? Because the law tells us that the offside of the batter shall be determined by the striker's stance from the moment the ball comes into play. So this batter, this ball, pitched outside leg stump, hands can not be given out. Well done, Zakuna. Uh, Tom, these are my revision questions for this evening. Uh, we can now open the floor for q and A. I'm handing over to you, Tom. Thanks, Dula. And thanks to all the candidates that uh, volunteered answers. All well, very well done. Now we move on to questions in the chat box. First one is from Amarjit. 
will the exam be on the amended laws or the previous cricket laws? Uh, Amarjit, the Cricket South Africa Level 2 exam is based on the 2017 code um, version uh, 1. And so we are not going to be examined on the new laws that are being in play from the 1st of October. Uh, after the 1st of October, there will probably be a new level two exam and a new level three exam, even a new level one exam introduced by Cricket South Africa. But up until then, we are still going to be examined on 2017 code edition one. And that is why at the beginning of this course, I emailed the PDF document with uh, that particular code of laws on it. Next question is, a few of you are answering the batter with the bat on his thigh or his hamstring. Uh, you were mostly correct in that the bat needs to be held in the hand for it to be considered part of the batter. So the batter was out of his ground and would have been stumped or run out, whatever the case might be for that delivery. I think only one person said not out. So uh, we just need to know that the striker was not in his or her ground in that example. K7 asks, when hitting the ball twice, protecting his wicket, after the second strike of the ball, can the striker run and will that run be allowed? Uh, Abdullah, I'm just going to mention that we didn't cover all of this law. Uh, again, I repeat that we are only covering the laws that are examined in the level two exam, and we're only covering parts of those laws that are examined. And that's why we didn't cover this. Uh, but we will answer your question. Abdullah, if I can hand that one over to you, please. Yes, thank you for your question, K7. So when a, a batter is allowed to legally protect his wicket so he's legally allowed to hit the ball a, a second time or a third time and the, and it's only allowed to hit it if he wants to protect his wicket that's the only time when a batter is legally allowed to hit the ball a second or a third time so your question is um, he's in this question he is legally protecting his wicket so he is allowed to hit it again Will any runs accrue to the striker? No, K7. No runs will be added to the striker's score. So yes, if he, if the striker hits the ball to protect his wicket, and let's say hits it so hard and it goes over the boundary for four, that boundary four will not be allowed. If he hits it so hard, if he hits it and let's say hits it to the mid-wicket boundary and the batters start to run and let's say they run two runs, those two runs will not accrue to his score. No runs are allowed if you legally hit the ball a second time to protect your wicket. Thanks, Tom. Abdullah, if I'm not mistaken, the um, bowlers and umpire should call and signal dead ball as soon as the first run is completed, or if the ball goes over the boundary. Correct, Tom. So, uh, so as soon as the, so you do give, uh, you do allow them to run. If they, once they've completed the run, so you, you do give the fielding side the opportunity to run out the batter. And if they complete the, the first run, the bowlers in umpire should then call and signal dead ball and send the batters back to the original ends. And no runs will be allowed. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks, Tom. 
Uh, next question, also from K7. It is regarding a leg before wicket scenario. The right-hander is on strike. There is a right-handed bowler bowling around the wicket. The ball pitches outside off stump and turns in, and the impact is in line, so between wicket and wicket. And he reckons the ball is going on to hit the stumps. What would the decision be? Many of his umpires that he knows have uh, doubts about this scenario. And he, in fact, has a doubt as well as to whether it should be given out or not out. Okay, Seven, let's go through all the points that you need to consider for an LBW. And also taking into account an LBW, uh, the LBW law is an opinion law. And um, we've, we've had this in many of our um, umpire training discussions. We'll show them, uh, we'll show, let's say, 100 umpires a LBW video and we'll ask out or not out. Lots of, many a times you'll see half would say out, half would say not out. Uh, because it's an opinion law, or someone looking at it, uh, according to, to that person, it's out. Someone else, in his opinion, uh, it will maybe not out. So to answer your question, let's go through the LBW law. And let's assume it's not a noble. So firstly, where did it pitch? Did it pitch outside off stump or between wicket and wicket? In your case, it pitch outside off stump. So, it, so the, that point ticked. So you, let's go on. Where was the impact? Was the impact between wicket and wicket, and did he play a shot? So looking at your example, the impact was between wicket and wicket, and he did uh, play a shot. Did it hit the bat? Uh, looking at your example, let's assume it didn't hit the bat. So what is the last question that you need to ask yourself? In your opinion, would the ball have gone on to hit the wickets? So according to the RBW laws, your example ticks all the, the boxes that you need to consider. And that final question that you need to ask yourself, would the ball have gone on to eat the wicket? So according to you, if it would have gone on to eat the wicket, you please give the better out LBW. So again, it's an opinion law. It's what, how you see it. And if you go through all the points that you need to consider, and if you tick all those boxes, including the last one, would it have, would it have gone on to eat the wicket? If, if your answer to all of them is yes, give the better out LBW. Thanks, Tom. Perfectly explained. Thanks, Tula. Next question is from Sriniketh. Shuniketh asks, will the questions appear from the laws that are not covered in the exam? For example, in law 5, we do not cover law 5.4. Will that, will there be a question on law 5.4? So Shuniketh, um, no is the answer. We have gone through the exam paper thoroughly and we know where the questions are all coming from. There are 22 questions in the exam paper and all of the laws and all of the parts of the laws that we have covered in our presentation are examined. There is no part of the law that is not covered in our presentation that will be examined. Okay, so I think our presentation for level two, excluding the revision questions, is 137 slides. So you need to study all 137 slides. You do not need to study all 318 slides from the level one presentation. What we have done is we have edited the level one presentation, reduced it to 137 slides, and all 137 slides of the level two presentation are examined in the level two exam. 
uh, you won't find questions that are not answered by this presentation. Next question is from Pankaj. Pankaj asks, what will the procedure be for writing the exam online for level two? Uh, so Pankaj, the first thing that you need to do is you need to uh, pay your exam fee. The exam fees are free for Western Province Cricket Umpires Association uh, members. And those of you who have applied to become members, you shall soon be receiving confirmation from our secretary Gaynor uh, via email that your application has been successful. So you do not have to pay for the level two exam. Uh, the people who are not based in Cape Town, they need to pay, if you are in South Africa, 200 rands. If you are outside of South Africa, you either pay 400 rands via wire transfer or you pay 27 US dollars via PayPal. When you receive your proof of payment, you need to generate that proof of payment and send it to yourself. Then you forward that proof of payment to me. Training at WPCUA.co.za and you will then let me know on that email when you forward me your proof of payment, which exam sitting you will be writing your exam in. There are two exam sittings. Saturday, 16th of July, 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. It's two hours for 100 marks. And of course, the pass mark is 80%. What will happen is I will have collected all of your email addresses once you have sent me your proof of payment. I will know that Pankaj, you are writing on Saturday 9 a.m. South African time, which is 12.30 in the afternoon in India. I will email all of those candidates who are writing in that particular time. Um, I'll email them the question paper. And I'll also email them a meeting link, a Microsoft Teams meeting link, so that at five minutes before 9 a.m. They join the meeting and they put on their camera and they put on their microphone. You will have printed out a answer sheet, which is blank, that you are going to use to write all of your answers in. I will email that to all of you uh, the day before. So you've got 24 hours to print your answer sheets. The question paper, I will email to everybody in that exam sitting five minutes before nine. You will receive that question paper and you will be allowed to view the question paper on your laptop screen. OK, if you don't have a laptop, a tablet is fine. If you don't have a tablet, a phone is also OK. It's not ideal because the writing will be small. But if you have no other options, then you may use the phone. What's important is that you will be watched while you write your exam for those two hours. So your microphone needs to stay on so we can hear that nobody's in the room with you and giving you answers. And we can see that you are not reading any material to help you answer the questions because the level two and level three exams are closed book exams. Once you have completed writing your exam, then you will scan and email me your answer sheets. And uh, all smartphones nowadays have the ability to scan uh, pages. Uh, please, guys, if you don't know how to scan your pages into one PDF, read up uh, on your phone and that functionality. It's very easy on an iPhone. I'm sure it's very easy on other smartphones as well. I don't want 10 pictures of your 10 pages. I want 
one PDF document submitted for your answer sheet. You will email that answer sheet to me uh, while I'm still watching you on Microsoft Teams, and then you will share your screen and you will show me deleting the email where you received the question paper because that question paper should not be circulated to anybody who is not in that particular exam sitting. Once I've received all of the answer sheets on Saturday and Monday, we will send them off to Cricket South Africa's uh, national panel of umpires who mark the papers and they will uh, come back with your results uh, hopefully within uh, two weeks it all depends on the number of candidates who are going to be writing the exams if there's only 20 candidates writing the exams then i'm sure it will be done within a week if there are 100 candidates writing the exams then it will take two weeks maybe a little bit more okay so Pankaj, I hope that uh, covers all the um, details around that. However, I will send a detailed email uh, the week leading up to the exam. So before our Monday lecture, I will send out a nice detailed email about the exams on Saturday the 16th and Monday the 18th of July. Right. Um, next question. Easton asks, where will we be able to get these slides? I missed lecture one because of work and also lecture four because of load shedding. Uh, Easton, if you were on my mailing list before the course started, I think I sent out the course material on the Monday before the course started on Wednesday. Um, so just check your emails to see um, the subject course material. If you do not have that email with the course material, then uh, punch in your email address now and I'll send you the level two presentation in full those 137 slides. Uh, K7 asks, can you tell the exact money of Indian rupee or Indian currency of $27 so that we can send via PayPal? Uh, K7, um, my knowledge of PayPal is that you will be sending me dollars, you won't be sending me Indian rupees. Okay, um, so please try and send 27 US dollars, not uh, Indian rupees, uh, because I don't know if my PayPal account uh, accepts rupees. Um, if you have any trouble, uh, you can uh, WhatsApp me on plus two seven eight two nine six two zero six four two. Okay, but just for your information, the equivalent of 27 US dollars is, let me check on YouTube, sorry, on Google. It's about 2,200 Indian rupees. Okay, but please try sending US dollars on PayPal, not Indian rupees. I'm not sure how that will work out. Okay, uh, Prabhu, please, I've got your email address. I will send you the um, Indian, sorry, I'll send you the level two presentation in full on that email address. Uh, Eastern, I see you too, and I'm just putting in my number so that K7, and text me if any problems with PayPal. Those are all the questions in the chat box. I see we've got three hands up. Ramesh, P. 
please unmute your microphone and address the floor. Uh, sorry, Tom, is uh, just before I put that uh, hand raise for uh, answering the revision question. OK, no question. so that's an old hand. No problem. Thanks, Ramesh. Um, Njuguna, is that an old hand or is that a new hand? Uh, if it's a new hand, please unmute your microphone and give us a shot. I suspect it's an old hand. So we will move on to the next hand, which belongs to Suhail. Suhail, if you are still there, please unmute your microphone and uh, give us a shot. I see Suhail. Is... Yeah. Hi, morning, Tom. I'm sorry, evening, Tom, and uh, mm. Salam Abdullah. Mm. Um, just two questions, guys. I don't want to take up a lot of your people's time. The one question number one is regarding timeout, and, and, and I hope we don't have to face this in our real life, real life time. Um, I, I would like to take you back to a game between South Africa and India. Uh, Graham Smith was a captain, and I think Rahul Dravid was a captain for India, and Sachin Tendulkar took a hell of a lot of long time to come out to bat. Um, I don't know if there was an appeal, and if there was an appeal, uh, what would the decision have been in, in that scenario? And then uh, question number two of mine is I'm a little, a little bit confused with regards to the LBW decision which you mentioned, where especially when the, when the striker switches uh, uh, stance. Now, I don't know if you've, I mean, I'm sure you remember the West Indies versus South Africa game where AB de Villiers was on a, on a rampage on um, uh, the West Indies bowlers. And I specifically remember where AB also started off as a left-hander and went on to hit uh, the guy for a six. But the thing is, in the event, if that was a LPW, but a, he, in, in the scenario of Abby de Villiers, he already started off with the stance as a left-hander, even before the bowler was bowling. Uh, I don't know if you can recall that specific uh, ball. Uh, um, yeah, so that is what is kind of confusing me about that specific role, because I know a lot of, in, even now in club cricket, you know, the youngsters, I, I, I do, um, I do umpiring of under 11s and, 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 and th under 13s and under 15s. And now they want to try and imitate A.B. De Villiers or they want to try and imitate Fav de Plessy and those guys. And they do these kind of things. I mean, most of the times I give them not out. But in the event, what happens in a scenario like that? Do you mind uh, giving me uh, your opinion about it, please? No problem, sir. Uh, two very good questions. I'm going to answer the first one about um, timed out and um, Sachin Tendulkar, and then I'll allow Abdullah to take you through the um, leg before wicket when a switch hit is changed and specifically when the batter changes his position or his stance before the ball has been bowled. Um, so um, I, I don't remember watching that myself, but I've heard uh, legend has it that Sachin Tendulkar was sitting in the toilet when uh, the wicket fell and being a test match, he was batting number four. And uh, and so he somebody had to go and knock on the toilet door to get Sachin Tendulkar to finish his business and come out to bat. Um, apparently that was at Newlands, if, if my memory serves me correct. So again, um, remember that we cannot give out a batter uh, without an appeal. So possibly there was uh, no appeal. Maybe there was just an inquiry by Graham Smith as to why Sachin Tendulkar took so long to come out to bat. And again, even if he did appeal, I think the umpires would probably have waited, like Abdullah has mentioned in his presentation, find out from the batter why he's taken so long to get to the wicket. And um, if it's a wholly acceptable reason, then I would suggest that the best decision to give is not out, even though he took more than three minutes to get to the wicket, um, simply because, like I said, it's a wholly acceptable reason. The man was in the toilet and um, he was struggling to finish his uh, deed. And so I think I, I would definitely remember if Sachin Tanduka had been given out, timed out, because 
Uh, it would have been a big story at the time. I'm quite sure he wasn't given out. Um, the spirit of the game prevailed, and if there was an appeal, it was withdrawn, and so Sachin was not given out, uh, timed out. I hope that answers that question. Abdullah, over to you for the leg before wicket question. No, thanks, Tom. Yeah, just to add to um, to your answer, um, there was no appeal, Tom, uh, um, on the Tindulka uh, arriving at the wicket uh, late. There was an inquiry, uh, but there was no appeal, so the umpires um, didn't have to answer anything. And I don't think Graham Smith would have appealed um, for a dismissal of time out on sessions in Tindulka. Good point. <laughs> <laughs> the um, to answer Sohel's question on the the LBW. So so Alvin, considering an LBW appeal, you need to go through the five uh, points, and if you tick all your boxes on the five points. You can give the better out, in your opinion, especially the last one. If you would have gone on to eat the wicket, you can give the better out LBW. So these days, uh, it's part of the game where they are um, where batters uh, switch. Uh, in a few three four years ago, it was just one or two. Uh, you know the KPs, the 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 uh, AB the Villiers, but these days it is common practice, even in club cricket, you'll find batters uh, switching. So it is important that you do need to know how to apply the LBW law when batters do switch. So if they do switch, the first thing that you need to remember very importantly, and this applies to the LBW law only, the the wide law is something uh, d different. I don't want to go touch on the wide law, but the, just the point I'm trying to make is for the LBW uh, mode of dismissal only, when it comes to switch hitting, and what I mean by switch hit, where the batter switches his stance. So from a left hand uh, batter, he now turns right around, uh, and the batter is now a right handed or the other way around. The batter is right-handed and he switches right around and now becomes a left-handed batter. So the moment you see that happening, you need to you need to keep your cool because when the batter's feet move, uh, arms move, batter switching around, you know your eyes go everywhere. Do not get put off by it. What all you need to remember is. If the batter was right-handed, and the moment that the bowler took his first step, you need to remember that the leg side will stay the leg side, even if the even if that batter switches to a now left-handed batter. Keep in mind that the leg side will stay the leg side. That's very important. So if it pitches outside leg stump for the right. Right-handed batter, even though he switched now to being a left-handed batter, just keep keep it and and remember, it pitch outside leg stump, not out. The um, the important thing that you need to remember when it comes to a switching, there is a time frame when the batter is allowed to switch. And that window period starts the moment the bowler's back foot lands. That is, from that moment onwards, the batter can start or can switch. The batter is not allowed to switch or uh, before the bowler enters his delivery stride. So, so i.e., the moment the back foot lands, only then the batter can switch it. Anything before that is not allowed. What do you do if a batter switch before the bowler's back foot lands? You actually need to go have a quiet word with the with the batter and tell the batter, batter, you are you are allowed to switch, 
but it needs to happen only after the bowler's back foot lands. If you do it again, meaning if you do switch before the bowler's back foot lands, I will then give you a first and final warning for time uh, wasting. So to summarize, the um, when it comes to switching, so you still apply the same five points that you consider for LBW uh, appeal. Whether the batsman stands still, whether the batsman switch, whether the batsman move. But in your example, if the batter uh, switches, just keep in mind there is a reasonable stance when the bowler started that stays uh, leg stump. And you still then go th through all, all the all the the bullet points. So if he's a noble, no, let's say it's not a noble. Did it pitch uh, outside off or uh, between the wicket and wicket? Well, uh, did it touch the bat? Let's say it didn't touch the bat. Was the impact between uh, wicket and wicket? And let's say uh, we assume that he played the shot. And the last question: Would it gone on to eat the the stumps? If you consider those five points, and if you answer to all those five points is yes, and in your opinion, that last one, it would have gone on to eat the wicket, you should give the better out LBW. But, uh, Tom, did I answer Soel's question? Uh, in my opinion, very well, Abdullah. Thank you for that thorough explanation. Uh, next hand that's up is uh, Victor. Please unmute your microphone. The floor is yours. Okay. Good, good, good evening, gentlemen. So my um, um, my question is: We go back on obstruction the field, eh? So remember one thing: You said that um, there's a player's safety. Then, if ever I go back, I think um, it was Cobras. I'm not sure who they were playing against. I think it was a triple header or maybe a 50 over at the Wanderers. Where, um, <clears throat> it was where Dane hit the ball and then um, the ball, I can't remember who was bowling. The guy hit the ball back and then Dane, and then Dane, he was out of the crease. And then I felt like if ever Dane, if ever Dane let the ball hit him, like maybe the ball it was going to hit him on the stomach or, or on the ribs. And then it was a TV game that um, it was a thing. It was a it was a TV. It, it was a TV empire. And then Dane was given out. So when we like um, as the empire, so like we, firstly, as you guys said, now we we're looking on players' um, safety, right? But like now in that situation, what happens if ever the ball hit Dane on on the body? Was um was the bowler still gonna was the bowler still gonna appeal or was the bowler gonna say sorry one? And then and then now as empires, how do you deal with that? Um Vic, let me take that one. I think I understand your scenario. Um so the batter was played a shot, uh came out of his crease, and then the Bowler fielded the ball and threw it back at the striker's wicket because the striker was outside his crease trying to run him out. And the ball was heading straight towards the striker. So the striker almost palmed the ball away because if he didn't palm the ball away, then it would have hit him directly. Um, have I understood that correctly? Was that the scenario? I think I'm going to carry on with that scenario as is Victor. Um, so it, it is a bit of a tricky one because it happened to Ben Stokes uh, in our one day game against Australia um, quite a few years ago uh, where I think it was one of the Australian quick bowlers um, fielded the ball and threw it straight back towards uh, Ben Stokes' stumps. And Ben Stokes, it looked like a 
uh, an instinctive, a reactive um, measure to try and protect himself. Uh, however, the ball actually wasn't going to hit him and, and was going in the direction of the stumps. So his hand ended up uh, making contact with the ball, um, but it, his hand ended up a little bit away from his body. So he his, his hand sort of instinctively, instinctively followed the ball to palm it away. Um, he ended up on the ground and he was... Um, naturally worried for his safety. So, of course, the easy way out for on-field umpires is to go upstairs to the TV umpire. And I think the mistake that the TV umpire made in that particular decision is they did not replay the ball uh, in live speed. They replayed it in slow motion. And slow motion uh, often gives the um, opinion or, or makes it look as if a, an action is willful, whereas um, I believe that was an instinctive reaction by uh, Ben Stokes uh, protecting himself or at least trying to protect himself. Um, so to avoid injury, uh, we've read Abdullah has explained that a striker should not be given out obstructing the field or, or even the non-striker if they are uh, trying to avoid injury when they cause the obstruction. So uh, very difficult. Uh, it is an opinion law. That's why Abdullah has mentioned get together with your partner, buy yourself some time, ask the fielding captain if they want to withdraw the appeal. If not, then talk through what you've both seen and make sure that there was a willful action by the uh, batter and that the batter was not trying to uh, avoid injury. And if you feel that the action was willful and the batter was not trying to avoid injury, then yes, you can give the better out obstructing the field. Uh, but in my opinion, and I will try and find that Ben Stokes incident and send it uh, with the recording of this lecture uh, on email. Um, I feel that decision should have been not out, but the TV umpire that day had a different opinion. Uh, it is an opinion law and he gave it out right so i hope that answers your question and that was a similar um scenario for you vic um club cricket you don't have the luxury of a television umpire uh, i would say guys uh, rather err on the side of not out in those contentious difficult decisions okay pavan uh, you've got your hand up next. Please unmute your microphone and go ahead. Thank you, sir. Good evening, all. Uh, uh, sir, just now we discussed the question related to time out. Uh, in that case, uh, you said that uh, if uh, he comes after three minutes and he has any wholly acceptable reasons, so we can give him out. But I was just going through. Uh, timed out law, but uh, I didn't find anything that can save him. So please, sir, uh, uh, tell me how to handle the case. Means how if query comes from a captain, how can we tell him? Thank you, uh, sir. You're, you're quite correct, uh, Pavan. Um, so uh, remember what we're doing is we are going through the law in preparation of the level two exam. Um, however, we are also trying to teach you guys um, practical on-field umpiring technique. And what Abdullah said is when there's an appeal for timed out, yes, first you need to consider if the batter took more than three minutes to get to the wickets, fine. But you also, it's good umpiring practice to find out from that better why he took more than three minutes. Now, if he tells me that he was 
drinking a beer and finishing his beer. And that's why he took more than three minutes to get to the crease. Then I will give him out because in my opinion, that's not a wholly acceptable reason. Now, the law doesn't write anywhere that if he has a wholly acceptable reason, then you don't give him out. But uh, we often refer to law 43 in the law book, which you all know there are only 42 laws, but we call law 43 common sense. So if a guy has been in the toilet or if a guy took five minutes to put his pads on because the team only has one or two sets of pads, then um, I will consider that a wholly acceptable reason for him to get to the crease after more than three minutes. So I would give him a uh, not out and I would explain that reason to the fielding captain. So. Um, I hope that answers your question. Uh, uh, can I say something, sir? Sure. Uh, sir, yes, uh, I agree. I completely agree with you. If this happens, practically we'll handle it this way. But uh, what I'm thinking, like, suppose it is a big match and if we give him out and if uh, they ask us uh, explanation, under which law you uh, gave him not out so that would that, that would be difficult and that is the the thing apart like practically we'll manage it somehow but now i'm thinking uh, i'm preparing for a national exam here in india so i'm thinking in that way so suppose this type of question is asked in uh, theory exam so it would be difficult for us to uh, answer this as per law yeah, in Thank a theory you, exam, Pavan, in a theory exam, stick to what the law says and uh, you will get the full marks for that question. Um, so if there was an appeal for Sachin Tendulkar, in theory, the umpires should have given him out. If there was an appeal for that youngster who took five minutes to pad up and get to the crease because his team only had once or two sets of pads, then the correct answer on a level two exam would be to give that um, that boy out. Um, but so so and and that is why on the presentation we are giving you the law and that is what you need to answer in the exam. Uh, but over and above the presentation, we are giving you umpiring techniques that you can use on field to have a good game where uh, everybody will be happy and the spirit of cricket will be promoted. OK, so please um, separate the theory and some of the practices that we use, which are outside of the law. OK. Varun. Thank you very much, sir. Completely satisfied. Thank you very much. You're welcome, Pavan. Uh, Varun, you've got you your. You both hand are up. awesome. <laughs> no, sir, sir. For that question only. You both are awesome, sir. Thank you very much. <laughs> You're welcome. Satisfied Pavan. completely. Thank you. Thank, thanks for joining us. Uh, Varun, uh, you've got your mic unmuted. The floor is yours. Yeah. Am I audible, sir? Yes, loud and clear. Yes. So uh, I have a question again related to timeout. So uh, the situation that you discussed earlier about Sachin Tendulkar, uh, hypothetically, suppose sir, uh, uh, Graham Smith uh, made an appeal for timeout and seeing this, the Rahul Dravid uh, send Zahir Khan instead of Sachin Tendulkar. In that case, Zahir Khan would be out timeout, right, sir? Well, I think the appeal would only be it depends when the appeal is made uh abdullah correct me if i'm wrong um obviously if Sachin tunduka is on the field then the appeal is for him if zahir khan was on the field then the appeal is for him if neither of them were on the field after three minutes and there was an appeal um then the finger would go up and i imagine that the person who was listed to come in next would be given out. Um, Abdullah, I'm, I'm not 100% sure about that one. 
Do you want to give us your input? Uh, Tom, the incoming batter will be given out. So they must nominate who the incoming batter is. So whoever the incoming batter is will be uh, given out. So here, sir, Zahir Khan would be uh, given out, right, sir? Now, if he was the nominated incoming batter to come in next, um, he will be given out, timed out, yes. Okay, so, so uh, that means uh, the score, uh, the nominated team that we give to the scorer, uh, sir, uh, here takes the precedence rather than the in incoming walking batsman. So, and Varun, was he walking down the stairs when the um, appeal came and the finger went up? Sir, so it was just a strategic move. Seeing, uh, you know, uh, that there would be an appeal. There's a first a fuzz in the, uh, you know, in the field. Uh, seeing this, uh, Raul Dravid uh, made a strategic move. Uh, so he sent the low order batsman just to make sure that Sachin Janduka isn't out. Is it possible? Yes. Uh, so Tommy, if I can answer that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Varun, the the innings of the incoming batter starts the moment he steps onto the field of play. So if if Zahir put his foot over the boundary rope, that means he, uh, the innings of Zahir started. So he, he's then the incoming batter. He would have then been given out. Um, I, can't really, I can't clearly remember the in, um, you know this particular uh, incident. I think because Sachins were taking so long, they got Zaire to pair up in the meantime because they knew someone else needs to uh, a, a, a batter needs to come back. Um, I don't have my uh, my facts. I'm not sure. I didn't actually see the incident. Lots of it. I've heard few stories about it, but I didn't see the uh, uh, the incident. So I think because Tendulkar took so long, uh, they quickly got someone else to pair up. But uh, but if Zaire stepped onto the field of play, you would have been the incoming batter and you would have been uh, given out. Did I answer your question, Varun? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay, thanks, Varun. Thanks, thanks. thanks Tom. Over to you. Thanks, Tula. Uh, Victor, you've got your hand up again. Is that a new hand or an old hand? It's a new hand. Go for it, Victor. All right, so now um, regarding, regarding uh, the law of changing the keepers. Right. So now, um, before before I go on with my question, eh, so I need to know one thing. Um, which um, what is what is the exact um law of changing the keeper? And then, so let's say now, um, we know that let's say. We can, um, isn't it? Let's say someone is coming from Maya. Let's say like now. Um, let's say who? Um, let's say now um, Queenie, the cock, ne? Is there anything? He's um, he's with the protest, and then suddenly the protest finished the game early. Then now he's been sent to keep for Titans, all right? Let's say um, the one is ended. So now, like day two, now I'm um, quenching. He, he, he's on nothing. He's on the field of play without, um, without, um, without, without concerns of empires, and then without concerns of of letting the opposition captain knows. And then how um, how do you, as an empire, um, deal with the situation? Abdullah, do you want to take that one? I, I got a message on my phone that distracted me, so I didn't hear everything. No problem, Tom. I'll, I'll take it. Uh, so, Vic, there are playing conditions um, in South Africa that governs the the four-day competition. So the playing condition in South Africa and, and, and for the rest of the attendees, this is not, uh, not law. Uh, I know each country has its own playing conditions for their four-day co competition. And in South Africa's four-day competition, there is a playing condition that governs national players 
uh, either being released from national duty or players going up to national duty. So if I can start, if I can start, so um, your example, you saying Quinton de Kock being released from national duty. So in a four day competition, if Quinton de Kock was released from national duty, according to the playing condition, he needs to uh, be at the ground at the start of day, at the start of day two, and needs to come to the ground, inform the umpires that he um, is was released from national duty and he's going to partake in this particular four day game. So he needs to be there on the morning of day two. If that is the case, Kwani will then be allowed, according to a playing condition in South Africa, to to uh, to play in that particular game. But it needs to happen either day one or the morning of day two. Anything after that, according to the playing condition, Quentin cannot, or any national player cannot join the game if it's after play start on day two. So that's that particular playing condition. Um, if it's a release up to, if a, if a player gets called up to national duty, that can happen at any time during the four-day game. So even the afternoon of day four, if a player gets called up to to represent uh, his country, that player can then can then um, be called up and be replaced. So to answer your question, Kuni cannot just come and play. Kuni uh, needs to be there either day one or the morning of day two. Uh, Informing the umpires that he's coming down from national duty, according to the playing condition, we will then allow Kwini to, to partake in this particular game, and Kwini can then uh, replace uh, whoever. Uh, Vic, did I answer your question? Um, yes, it is. Thanks. Okay, they are. thanks, Vic. Thanks, Tula. I'm just uh, reading questions that have come in on the chat box. Uh, Shrini Keth asks, for those who have cleared level two and level three, will they get a chance to officiate matches in South Africa? Uh, Shrini Keth, uh, we do have an exchange program whereby we have an Indian umpire, Harsha, who comes to South Africa uh, almost every summer. Obviously, COVID caused a few problems for a couple of years, but he was here this previous um, season from February and March. And uh, we also have on the line today, Adrian van den Dries, who's from the Netherlands, but also comes to Cape Town every South African summer for a couple of months to officiate because it's obviously winter in the Netherlands when it's summer here. So you don't even need to have passed level two and level three. I think um, Harsha had done level one with us online and then he came to South Africa. And uh, while he was umpiring uh, for a couple of months here, he also did level three with us. So um, just note that we do not accept any uh, liability for your um, accommodation, your travel and your visa fees. So you need to get to South Africa on your own account. You need to um, find accommodation uh, or, and, or at least pay for accommodation on your own. What you can do is you can uh, ask me and I'll tell you uh, what are good places to stay. And Airbnb is the easiest way to book accommodation. Um, visas are also complicated depending on where you're coming from. Um, so if you're coming from India, Harsha has got experience of getting visas from uh, the South African embassy in India to come to South Africa on a tourist visa, which allows you to stay up to three months. Uh, we will pay your match fees in cash, uh, but note that um, we obviously give priority to our uh, local members first in terms of uh, standing in matches, especially matches during the week. Um, those are usually done by our uh, umpires who do not work. So uh, you will get matches, but 
you will not be able to make a living out of umpiring in South Africa. You won't be standing Monday to Sunday and earning uh, 50,000 um, Indian rupees a week. Um, it's not a, a profession uh, at that level. Um, so all you would need to do is uh, email uh, me um, and I'll forward your email to our match secretary to let us know when you are planning on coming to South Africa and how long you'll be staying for. And uh, we will make sure that you do get some games. So uh, everyone is welcome. Uh, just you need to make it to Cape Town on your own. And also your living expenses are for you to cover. Okay. Um, what else do we have here? So Pavan um, asks how much it will cost for you to come to South Africa. Pavan, you'll have to Google flights to find out how much they are. And then you'll have to Google Airbnb. Um, for ease of reference, you can um, check properties in Newlands. We know Newlands is where uh, Newlands Cricket Ground is. So that's the suburb where a lot of uh, cricket is played. So there you can put in the number of days that you want to stay and an Airbnb quote will come up to tell you how much you will pay. Um, and then food and drinks. Um, you're probably looking at, I don't know, uh, 150 rands a day, which you can translate to about 500 rupees, if I'm not mistaken, per day. Okay. Uh, Shuniketh, it's per match, the first division A and the premier division, uh, I think is 500 rands per uh, match, which is about 2,500 uh, Indian rupees per match that we pay. Uh, the division lower than that is about 475 rands per 50 over match, which is about 2,300 rupees, somewhere there. So guys, please, uh, you need to email me uh, after having checked all of the costs that are involved and then I can give you more information if required. Okay. Varun, you've got your hand up. Is that an old hand or a new question? Varun, please unmute your microphone if it's a new question. Otherwise, I will assume it is an old hand and I will Thank all of you for your participation this evening. Before I close off, uh, Adian, I did notice that your hand was up during the uh, obstructing the field uh, question that Victor uh, gave. Uh, do you want to give some input on that? Yeah, at the moment, uh, let's say I'm doing a setup by training for the ICC. Um, and Let's say there we always try to get the full speed of the direction, not slow motion. So uh, the director likes to give slow motion because it looks nice on television. But for us yeah. obstruction, we want to have the full speed camera work to get the impression that's willful, willful out of the way. Perfect. Thanks for confirming that, Adian. Um, very good point. Slow motion always makes um, an action seem willful, uh, whereas it might just be a an instinctive reaction. Thank you very much yeah, for that look, input. Uh, look, look, someone has time to do something which he doesn't have in real time. Correct. Uh, and uh, from, from my side, uh, I joined in today. A very nice session. Well done, guys. Uh, a good, clear uh, session going through the loss. Also always good to do for everybody to listen in. 
Thank you very much, uh, Adrian, for your kind words. And I'd like to take this opportunity to wish you well in Finland. I understand you'll be going there for European World Cup qualifiers. So yep, all the best. Starting this Sunday. And Harsha. And uh, I know you'll be in good hands there with Aludin Palika taking care of you guys. So uh, enjoy it and all the best. Thank you, Tom. Once again, thank you all for participating in a very active uh, session this evening. That's how we learn and help each other to get better on the field as well as with our theory. We will join up again on Monday where we will conclude the course with Law 41, Fair and Unfair Play. We'll go through a few um, examples there for you. Uh, some of which will not be examined, but we will let you know what is examined and what is not examined uh, so that you, in terms of preparation for your exam, you focus on the examinable uh, parts. Um, but yeah, thank you very much. Have a good evening and weekend when it comes. We shall speak again on Monday. Thank you and good night. <laughs> <laughs> Shalom, <laughs> Shoel. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Have a good evening. Bye. <laughs>